Hey everybody, welcome back to the Anyway Whatever podcast. I am your host, Mike Fisher, and today's guest is Pat Kim, um, my new BFF. <laughs> Me and Pat, um, our wives are friends, and um, we never really met uh, in person until we did this interview, and we we hit it off. Um, we, we have all the same interests in life, uh, kind of amazing. So uh, maybe when all of this quarantine stuff is over, me and Pat will actually get to meet in person. Um, so if you are listening on the audio version, please give subscribe and give us a like wherever it is that you get your podcast content on, on iTunes. Um, a written review goes a long way. We're starting to really see an audience build here. Uh, we have a very consistent listener base of regular weekly listeners and YouTube viewers and just really excited about that and want to help keep building that by um, subscribes on YouTube and and likes and reviews on the audio versions. Um, you can find us online on social media at Anyway Whatever Podcast, uh, on Twitter at AWP underscore podcast, and my personal Instagram is at Maximum Fluoride for my art and design. So yeah, kick back and listen to me and Pat chat about um, tattooing and being in the music business and all sorts of other stuff. It's a, it's a fun one. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Anyway Whatever podcast. I'm your host, Mike Fisher, and today's guest is uh, multi, multi-talented multi creative guy, Pat Kim. Uh, Pat is uh, a musician and an artist and a tattooist, amongst all sorts of other things. Um, what's up, Pat? How are you? Good. How you doing, Mike? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. It's, it's it, it, The sun's going down, so it's cooling down out here in the San Fernando Valley. Oh, is that where you're at? San Fernando Valley? Yeah, 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 cool. yeah, yeah. We're out in the West Valley, like Woodland Hills area, Canoga Park. Nice. Yeah. It's, are you, you, did you, did I, did you say when, when, when we were talking before, are you, are you from like the Glendale area? I grew originally? up in Glendale. I moved to Glendale, uh, when I was in fourth, fourth grade. I'm not sure what, how old I was then, but yeah. So, uh, I, otherwise I was living over by the MacArthur Park area and then, you know, as I was getting older, my parents start freaking out because uh, it's either get this kid out of this area or he's going to become <laughs> some gangbanger or some shit like that. You know, so let's <laughs> let's yeah, take yeah. him to the suburbs of Glendale, you know. That that neighborhood's still rough. It's like one of the last ungentrified parts of that part of L.A. We, we were in Echo Park for like eight years. We moved out here like um, three years ago. Um, and yeah, like MacArthur Park is still pretty sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> for sure um but yeah it, yeah um I, when i first moved to la my my kids were all little like one four six and um we were like in mid-city like um park la brea area and uh it was like the same thing like once my oldest one started getting close to uh like junior high was like yeah, we probably need to not have all the kids go to high school at Fairfax High School. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> let's, yeah, yeah. let's move out to the valley. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then when did you go down to San Diego? San Diego, I went right out of high school. because uh, So I graduated high school and I applied to a bunch of colleges and SDSU was the only one that accepted me. So it's, you know, that's, that was my only choice, really. So I moved to San Diego then, you know, and that was... Uh, what is that? 89, 88, 89. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before we get too far along, is there any um, social media you want to give people um, so they can check out your artwork, your tattoo stuff? Yeah. For my tattoo stuff, it's PK. Uh, I think it's underscore the little, the minus sign that's on the bottom, right? Is that underscore? Yeah. Uh, underscore. Okay, yeah. So PK underscore tattooer for tattoos. Uh, my personal stuff I ain't going to give out, but I also do like wood burning. So it's, I uh, do pyroglyphics, uh, five, two, six, uh, on Instagram. And 
I mean, if you want to look at some stuff, I used to do these uh, lunch bags for my kids. You know, now they're kind of grown up now, so I don't really give a shit. So I stopped doing them. But you can look at the back catalog those, on those, and there it's munch bags um, on Instagram. And I just used to do like a bunch of punk rock, rock and roll, hip hop, like do artwork on their lunch bags. So you can check those out. Some of them are pretty fun. And, uh, yeah, my, my wife was like, you got to talk to Pat about the lunch bags. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so to kind of go back to um, the San Diego thing. Um, so you went to school in San Diego and then you uh, at that at some point in that you ended up in the band um, Sprung Monkey, correct? Yes. So, yeah, straight out of um, high school, I moved to San Diego and I moved out there with uh, a good friend of mine, John Pebsworth, who. I'm not sure if you remember a band called Bucko Nine, ska band. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So John and I used to be in a punk band together in uh, at, at Glendale High School when we were growing up. You know, we went to junior high, high school together and we had a punk band called Labeled Victims. And we did that San Gabriel backyard parties and stuff, you know, doing all that stuff. And then uh, once I graduated high school, he's all like, fuck, man, I ain't got shit to do. I'm, I'll, I'll go out there with you because I didn't stay at the dorm. I just kind of free balled it and got in you know was just gonna go apartment style so he went my, he moved out to san diego with me you know so that's how i ended up out there and then you know right away i just had to be in a band you know i was trying to find a band to be in so that's how it's <laughs> sure. you guys you know <clears throat> that's awesome and then you uh you went from sprung monkey sprung sprung monkey into um unwritten law correct yep so yeah unwritten law was uh doing unwritten law to, uh, shit, man. 2009, I think. Whenever the self title album came out. So that's when you, you, wait, you joined in. Wait, wait, is that right? 99? Two. It was the late 90s or was it? Oh, I'm sorry. It was ni- uh, 98, I think. <laughs> See, I'm all, I'm all jacked up. <laughs> I was like, wait, time you frame. just took 10 years yeah, off your yeah. time in that band. <laughs> Yeah, so it was, yeah, 98. I'm sorry, yeah, 98. So that's cool. when I was and, up, then, yeah. like, and then you were in until, like, what, 2011, 2012, somewhere around there, yeah, yeah as, as I understand. I think it's been about eight years now since I've been out of the band, so. Yeah, officially retired yes. from music. Or, uh, you're, you're like, yeah, I remember, um, like, I was tell, uh Pat's wife, Marcy, um, is was also a guest. I don't know what order everything's going to get um, released in. I'm pretty sure Marcy's going to be in before you, but so people will be familiar with Marcy Harmon, who is um, Pat's wife. And so uh, as I was, as me and Marcy were, were talking about, um, I, I heard, I hear about you from my wife through your wife. And so <laughs> I remember at the time uh, when you were first starting to learn to tattoo, um, Chrissy was like, yeah, you know, Marcy's husband, Pat, like he's learned how to tattoo. Like, and, and I was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I needed, to, I needed a regular art gig, um, because like the merch design and, and like album cover layouts and, and cover paintings and all that kind of stuff wasn't quite covering everything. So I, I reached out to all my tattooist friends, all my, my friends who tattoo and talked to all of them about, um, whether they think that I would be a good, that would be a good gig for me uh because i mean I, I i've been asked more times than i can count in my life like why don't you tattoo um uh, right. and then i looked into it and it was like I, I think the the apprenticeship thing was what was kind of the the problem for me is i was like i just can't not make money um for that long you know like <laughs> and so i was like so i just decided to airbrush instead of tattoo which is not that much different anyway yeah 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 right and so, so you went through like a traditional apprentice program? Uh, yes and no. So, you know, after I, I quit uh, Unwritten Law, I knew I wanted to go towards the art field, you know. So I started taking classes at uh, Pasadena City College and um, doing like Illustrator and Photoshop, you know, because I, I was like, I'm going to get into graphic design. That's, you know. Mm-hmm. And then realized once... And you got to understand at that point, I'm already kind of old, you know? So I'm in this classroom <laughs> yeah. with all these youngsters and I, it was, I realized like I couldn't really keep up with it. I'm like old school. I used to do flyers at Kinko's cut and paste guy, you know? So sure. trying to 
learn the newest shortcut, the new version of this, and are you updated? And all, it's like it kind of became a little bit overwhelming for me, you know. I mean, I'd like messing with it now on, at my own leisure, but like then it's like it was just a bit too. I was like, it's kind of. I don't think this is my thing, you know. So yeah. I was kind of lost for a minute, and then uh, found out one of my really good friends in San Diego at the time, uh, Glenn Sluter, uh, opened up his own tattoo shop. So I was all like, light bulb, you know, because I always love tattoos and, you know, the whole craft of it, the art of it, you know. And so um, I hit him up and, uh, you know, we're really good friends. You know, I used to actually live with him and his parents, you know, when I lived in San Diego at, for a time. So and he understood my situation. I already had the kids. I was living in LA, and he was like, all right, dude, you give me at least three days a week. I'll teach you how to tattoo. So. I did the commute. I was living in LA at the time. I'm in, you know, in the Highland Park. And uh, so mm-hmm. I would drop my kids off at school Tuesday morning, go straight to San Diego, couch surf until Thursday, you know, until all this shit was done at the shop and drive back home. And I did that, you know, and I did that for like three years, three plus years, you know, Wow. and that was wow. uh, apprenticeship. But like you said about the whole apprenticeship thing. Yeah. It's, it's when you're like, fucking 40 <laughs> you know and, and it's not like these, <laughs> right. you know but luckily i had you know marcy was just you know super supportive and she was kicking she i mean she's a killer you know so she's a hustler so she made it happen where you know supported the whole the family while i was learning she's all, all right you better fuck it. if you can do this and fucking do it right so i did <laughs> right so because it's, you know, really because she really made it happen, you know. So I did that. And, um, you know, my my training there was, in you know, as gnarly as a lot of the other people who get apprenticeships, you know. You know, I didn't have to go through yeah. too much of that stuff. But I did put in my time and I was first and last one there, you know. And um, after even, uh, you know, he kind of got me, sped it up for me. I got like the clip note version, you know. <laughs> and uh, right. so, you know, he's all, you can tattoo on grapefruits and whatever all you want. You're never going to really get the feel until you hit human flesh, you know? And uh, mm-hmm. it's true, you know? So I got into it. So within the first year, you know, I started tattooing, you know, friends and guinea pigs and stuff. And um, yourself. And that, <laughs> yeah, I got myself as well. And, and I, <laughs> I went that route, you know, and you know it, it, it all passed and you know after i did learn all the aesthetics of tattooing and and everything you know he's a good friend of mine so i also didn't want to be that guy with, hey thanks for teaching me how to tattoo bye-bye you know so right. i stuck around I, and i kept doing it for two years after so i was there like i said three plus years uh still commuting and you know and the reason why i quit the band was i hated touring you know, especially once I had my kids, Dude. you know, you know, <laughs> same. It was so <laughs> like there was like the, the the tour where you're less like, I am never, ever doing this again. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, I mean, the shit's fun when you're younger, but like up till when I had my kids, then shit started changing. You know, I didn't you, you know, we didn't Skype was still not quite around you know i think we're just starting you know you start to buy phone card in australia you know do all weird shit like that and um i didn't like coming back and seeing my kids at a whole nother stage that i missed you know so that was a yeah. part of me quitting but then i you know of course i still end up couch surfing <laughs> you know for three years but you know it's better than being totally. gone for like that's crazy eight months at a time you know so right and if you had to come back you could come back i'm sure you know in San Diego, it's not that far from LA. No, no, it was some situation where you needed to come back. Yeah, absolutely. So it was do. Yeah, I mean, you definitely toured on a way different level than than I ever did for sure. Because I was just like in a you know crust punk D beat band, and we you know we were playing squats and fucking basements and <laughs> all sorts of shit like that. Like uh, it was it was unpleasant most of the time. I'm not. Uh, 
I have nothing but respect for that whole scene. And, you know, I kind of am born from it. But um, as a 40 year old man, I was like, man, I'm not sleeping on this dirty floor ever again, dude. (laughs) Uh, Because I was like, you know, I was in bands in the 80s and none of them ever did much. Um, My my last band, No Warning, um, was just starting to get to the spot where we were probably going to start doing things like we were we were we were going to get a deal and we were going to go start touring and stuff and then you know i started having kids when i was in my late teens and that kind of went away but and then i didn't get back into a band until um until like you know when i was like 39 and me and my me and my my kids what mom split up um you know totally amicable is all fine um, and then like all of my friends who were like these famous death metal guys were like, we're going to start a crusty D beat band and we want you to sing. Cause you're like the old, old <laughs> punk rock guy. And I was like, I was like, fuck, all right, I might as well. Like all my kids were like getting to, you know, like my boys were both over 18 and my daughter was living with her mom. And I was like, I can fucking go on tour if I want to. So, <laughs> so I did that for like four or five years and, um, it was super fun and I loved it, but I definitely got to the point where I was like, man, I don't want to. I don't want to be gone from my girl for that long. I don't want to sleep in a van. I don't want to, you know what I mean? I got, it, and so, yeah, it was, it wasn't, you know, I stepped off, I stepped off that train and that band's still going. DI destroyed in seconds. DIS is still going. And they actually just put out a new record and it's, it's way better than anything yeah. that, that they put out when I was in the band. Um, they, you know, it was like, I knew who I wanted to replace me. Uh, and so like literally like our last, my last show with the band was at, uh, obscene extreme festival in Czech Republic. And I was like, after we played, I was just like, Hey guys, like, this is it for me. Um, you guys should call John Tamal and John should be your singer. And they were like, well, if you're leaving and John wants to do it, then that's like, obviously the the perfect fit. And like, as literally as soon as they got back, me and <laughs> I was out and John was in and he's, he's still been doing it now with them for shit, almost 10 years. Wow. And, uh, good dude. And the band's much, much better off <laughs> with John singing than they ever were with me. That's for sure. That's great. That's hilarious. Yeah, and it's actually it's funny because I uh, are you familiar with um, the artist uh, Mark Richards' heavy hand illustration? No, he's like the metal guy for like the last few years. Um, he just started tattooing, and I talked to him last week too. And and we we he, we had a similar conversation about his apprenticeships and stuff. And um, he actually did the cover for the new DIS record. Um, but yeah, he's he his episode. You're gonna want to watch his episode. It's super killer. Um, so, are, are you playing music at at all at this point? Like even for fun or? Right now, it's strictly only for fun. So I have a little, you know, I have a buddy of mine who lives up here in Placerville, who um, Marcy and his wife Karina used to work together in San Francisco, and we used to live like a block away from each other down in Hayes Valley. And so we've known each other for a really long time and he's played in bands around Sacramento and San Francisco. And now he, they moved up here into town, which is awesome. So I have a little homie out here, you know, and he used to be an engineer back in the day, you know, so he knows how to do all the, you know, turning knobs and stuff. So he brings his stuff over, usually records stuff like two times a week. It's awesome. So, you know, we just, program drums and then we just kind of just try to relive some glory days but you know just trying to play some thrash and punk stuff you know and it's 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 fun as hell you know kind of like our little yeah i mean out outing it's nice that i mean when when you play the type of music that we listen to um for the most part it it is for fun <laughs> because there's usually not a lot of money involved no. in it um it's like, uh, it's, it's a super expensive hobby if you're, if you're in like a club band, like, you know, if you're going on tour in the United States and you're playing bars and clubs, it's like you're basically getting peer, paid in alcohol <laughs> and gas money. And that's about it. Yeah. So yeah, I do play for fun now at home and it's, it's awesome. And yeah, it's great. I love it. That's awesome. Do you play guitar and bass or are you pretty much primarily a bass player or do you go? Um, primarily bass player, but like for when I jam with Cyril, you know, when he, he's here, you know, we write stuff. I play guitar, record on guitar and then, you know, we'll switch off, you know, like why don't you do bass on this track or, or whatever, but we're both doing guitar tracks and then we'll switch off on, on bass. Cause he's also a bass player as well. So we'll just be like, I awesome. think you should do this one or you should do this one, you know? 
That's great. Yeah, that sounds super fun. That sounds fun. I'll have to check that out. You'll have to send me some tracks of that stuff. Yeah, 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 for sure. We actually did a a, a cover. We did a, um, we did a GBH cover for a compilation, and I had a um, what do you call it? My old I, Joe Truck, who I used to work for in LA, owns Ace of Hearts Tattoo and stuff, you know. And uh, he's an old like New York punk rocker dude, you know. And so he came in and did some vocals, and it was, it was just it was awesome, you know. Diplomatic community. That sounds awesome. Yeah, for a comp, it was fun. That's a good one. <laughs> and you do everything in, in your bedroom, you know? It's crazy. Yeah, so it's you, crazy. It's super crazy. And it sounds great, you know? Uh, yeah, I was in a band with, uh, uh, with two other graphic designers and uh, a recording engineer. <laughs> so like we always had everything covered <laughs> from like, you know, I could design and illustrate T-shirts, uh, album art could be done by by our other guitar player. Um, are you familiar with the band Phobia, grind band? I've heard of them. Yeah, yeah. The, the guitar player, um, both of the guitar players were formerly in Phobia uh, in DIS and then um, bass players from a band called Mange and our drummer was from a death metal band called Eat the Living. But um and then, you know, one of the guitar players, um, Leon, is also from, you know, he's in Exhumed and Intronaut and Murder Construct and like a dozen other bands, <laughs> Impaled. He's like the superstar music guitar player guy. Right. Um, so that, yeah, that was kind of a weird thing because it was like, we recorded, a de- we recorded enough songs to do a demo and like literally that demo, we had like offers from three labels like right away like hey what are you guys doing with this you know and so we it was cool we got to like pick a label which was uh weird oh well yeah you get to actually pick <laughs> it was weird it was weird so we ended up putting it out on deep six um because we were all super into um you know power violence and all that like low lo-fi grind stuff that deep six does um so yeah, they, they put that out in the States and then, um, powered up in, in Germany, um, did, did the European release. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. Like I, I, I miss being in a band cause I, you know, I miss being on stage. Like that's always been super fun for me. Um, but I, I never liked recording I, and, and aside from just not wanting to like live in a van for six weeks at a time, I got tired of hauling gear cause I wasn't the type of singer who was like, that's not my job. Like I always lugged a goddamn Ampeg coffin, you know, awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> so it was like, I don't want to do this shit anymore. I'm fucking 42 years old. I don't need this bullshit. <laughs> I had two of those, dude. I used to lug two of those coffins in their, uh, in their shells, you know, <laughs> the trap flight cases. Oh, it was horrid. <laughs> yeah we we played uh one time one on our one a u.s tour we we played this um like fucking uh squat in in uh south chicago um there was like literally like anarchy flags like autonomous zone flags like hanging out the the windows of the front of the building and uh it was like a four-story um like walk up and we had to fucking lug that thing up this uh-huh like almost vertical four flights of stairs into this like live. Oh man. It was like, it was the worst. I hated those. Ampeg amps are the absolute worst thing on earth. Those things are backbreakers for sure. For sure. They're so heavy. They're so so heavy. heavy. But they sound so goddamn good. They yeah, really they do. do. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they, they do. Like, and like, <laughs> and there's you know, a reason. <laughs> It didn't matter where we played. It was like always full stack, triple Mesa, yeah. triple rectifiers. Like, <laughs> like, it was like if we were playing in a tiny ass like basement at a at some place in Manhattan, it was like full stacks, <laughs> full stacks, yeah. and the ampeg. You know, it's like full balls out. I would stack mine um, sideways, but stack them so it just looked even bigger. You know. So I'd lay them on top Dude, of each other, but gnarly. sideways. <laughs> that's gnarly. Yeah. That is super gnarly. Um, so your time with Unwritten Law, like how many records were you on with them? Um, so I came in on the self-titled. It was already recorded. 
uh, and then because I was living in San Francisco at the time, and um, mm. what happened was I was working at a Streetlight Records in Nueva, and I was out mm. there, and then I got a call from Scott Russo. You know, he actually called me at work. He got my number through a mutual friend, Jen Zip, and then uh, and uh, he was like, hey, um, we just finished recording this uh, record, you know, and was wondering if you'd be interested in trying out you know and initially at first because you know we used to play together a lot when i was in sprung in san diego you know we did a bunch of soma sure. shows we did a lot of touring together with you know for those uh momentum focused surf videos with like pennywise blink seven seconds you know so we were already friendly and knew each other well you know and so they called me up and initially i was like uh, i don't know because i was never really super into like you know, uh, unwritten law that at the at the time, Blue Room, Oz Factor, great records, but I wanted to go heavier. You know, I, I'm always like the heavier sure. side of of the music, and they're pretty pop, pop punk friendly. Yeah, you I mean, know? I, I don't think it's an insult to call them a pop punk band. I mean, no, like, no, that's not really at what all. They are. I mean, they're yeah. they're right in line with Blink and and all those bands. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. absolutely, exactly. And then, oh well, let me just send you the the record. And so he mailed it to me. I got it. And then when I, the second I played, I played, press play, I was like, holy shit, they just kind of morphed, they kind of found their thing, you know? And that, it, it's, it, to this day, I think of all the records, even the ones I played on, the self-titled, the black record is the shit. I, you know, I can still actually listen to it now and be like, that's a good fucking record, you know, all the way through. <laughs> it's solid, you right. know? And I'm not on it, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so the second I heard it, I was all like, fuck, all right. And I had just kind of only just moved to San Francisco. I was only out there for like a year at that, that point. And then I was like, fuck, I'm in. I'm going to do it. So I moved back to San Diego. I joined. And um, it was it was kind of trippy, too, initially joining that band because we did a few shows with Face to Face. But before mm -hmm. they actually officially got me in there, it was like I did a uh, they The guy who, uh, Micah, uh, who played the bass, who they had to come in and play bass. He was from a band called Pivot at the time uh, mm -hmm. in San Diego. So they were still weren't sure to, to, if they wanted him in the band or me. So they had us both go on this little road trip kind of thing. It, it was a weird, it was kind of weird, trippy, you know? That is a weird, that is weird. And, you know, like, see, it's like a bass playoff kind of thing, I guess, you know? So, um, well, and also you got to see if you want to be able to, if you can like survive, you know, on tour with somebody, cause some people tour better than other people, you know? And like, that's like a, I mean, that's a real thing that people don't really realize. Yeah. Like you have to be able to, to live with somebody for weeks and weeks and weeks in a confined spot under extreme <laughs> situation so I, I i guess i kind of get it in that regard yeah yeah so we did that and um you know i they offered me the, the gig and so i took it you know and they took me off and back in san francisco and then ended up i packed my shit and moved back to san diego and and it was just we were basically living on the road from that point on you know and uh, yeah and luckily, you know, at the, you know, Unwritten Law is like, it's a trippy band because I, it, it's it's like every band that's used to open up for Unwritten Law got huge. You know what I'm saying? And then it's like yeah. Unwritten Law's also been on pretty much every major label, you know, because, you know, when Oz Factor was on like Epic, Sony, right? And then the Black Album was on Interscope. And then after getting dropped off Interscope, we went to Lava, which was, I think, Atlantic, you know. It's just, we pretty much made the rounds, you know, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> right. Like, that's kind of unheard of as well, you know. You don't get that many chances with the band, Right, you know? I think on me, me and Joe Sibbs' episode where we were talking, we kind of went over that, where, where Wax had gotten dropped and then got re-signed, and, and it was like, just that one time was kind of insane. So to hear that 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 unwritten law had that multiple times. That's like, you, you're right. That is kind of unheard it's of. It's unheard of, man. So, and it was like, wow, this is, it's, it was a weird thing. It's like, you had this little carrot dangled in front of you, you know, it was just so close. You know, we, 
it was a, it was a you know, and at that point, you I remember with TR, we were on TRL and shit, weird shit like that, you know. <laughs> and it just, yeah. we just always kind of missed the boat for some reason, you know. So it's a, it's a trippy scenario. I think about it sometimes too. I'm like, I wonder what would happen if, you know, if the shit went the way it was supposed to, you know. Yeah, that that it, that's totally crazy. Cause I, cause I, I and I, you know what? If you if somebody asked me like what what is your impression of Unwritten Law? That would be what it is. Like they're the band that was as good as every other band around them, but for some reason just didn't hit like Blink or you know Face to Face or you know bands like that. Like I I, I think at Offspring Green like, Day, Dancehall yeah, Crashers crazy. were another one that was kind of like that, where it was like you could see that they were going to, that they had everything that was in place to be a big thing. And then it's never happened for whatever reason, you know? Yeah. And they were a great yeah, band yeah, yeah, too, you sure. know? I mean, even like what, I think Blink even called out, you know, Dan, DHC and UL in one of their songs, you know? And yeah, we just always kind of just missed the boat, you know? And it's, we made the rounds too, man. We busted ass. We were on like, Jay Leno, David Letterman, we we're on all those shows, you know, and it was just, it was just somehow. You guys had a couple it, songs you know? that did pretty good, though, if I remember correctly. I I can't remember the names of them because that 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 whole style of punk is definitely not my thing. I don't not like it, but my sons yeah. were way more into those bands than I was for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, like you know, I was always considered myself the guy. Caught, I'm not sure if you ever saw that old uh, footage of that they called the drummer in the wrong game <laughs> yeah, going yeah, all yeah, crazy. Yeah, it's, it's hilarious, you know. So I always felt like I was like, because I was this long hair like Hesher dude in this pop punk band, and like my style on stage, I I thought I was a Slayer, <laughs> you know, and like, but I, but we're singing like these pop songs like this, and it just I always felt like I was a little bit out of place in that band, but you know. But it, it, yeah, man, it, it's just, it's crazy. Like what we had to go through, you know, going through yeah, all but, that you stuff. know, we got to be a professional musician for a good long stretch and that is not something everybody gets. Yes. You know, that's pretty amazing. No, that's, it's yeah. a lottery. Yeah. It's like winning the lotto <laughs> for real. Like I got to travel. I see it, you know, which is, that's one of my greatest, you know, things about being this fan was like, you know, we because we were actually really big in uh, Australia. <laughs> I actually have a gold record from Australia, hanging at my wow, mom's place. Awesome. You know, which is funny. Yeah. So in us, and I. So when I was playing in UL, we were hitting Australia about like once to two times a year. So you look at my passport. I've been to Australia like twenty-two times. You know, it's crazy. That's it's all definitely Australia. one of the places that I never got to go that I would like that I'd like to go. I have, I have friends over there, um, you know, from the video game industry and stuff. Um, and I would love to go to Australia sometime. That's like on the short list of places I'd like to go. So I'm a little jealous that you got to go so many times. Yeah, it's an amazing place. And I still have some of my best friends are, you know, that I'm still in contact with are all, you know, Australians, man. They're, it's it's a lovely place. Yeah, lovely absolutely. people too. They work hard and party harder. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. awesome. Of, of, Good of, people. Of all the sure. people in the world that I've encountered, they're probably the only people more so than Americans who are proud of being where they're from. Like Australians are so proud of Australia yeah. and being Australian. It's it's almost it's almost like the the, like, uh, you know, um, that, that American exceptionalism, but like Australians have it really bad. Um, but you know, you know, you know, of course, because it's a beautiful place and you know, everybody I've ever known there was super awesome. It's a little bit contagious. Cause every time it like makes me, I'm like, I wish I was Australian, you know? Cause like I said, it's every time I go there, it's, it's, it's hard to come back home a lot of times, you know? It's like, dang, man, this place is the shit. Yeah, totally. You know? I kind of felt and, that way about the Netherlands. I really, really fell in love with, with Holland when, when I was in Europe. And if I could live anywhere other than the than Southern California, I probably would want to live in, in Holland. It's just, everybody was so nice and the country's so cool. It's just such a cool culture, you know? It's like super art, art heavy. Right, right. And um, yeah. Yeah, I really, I, I loved Europe in general, but, you know, 
It was cool. It was it, you know if 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 being in a punk band can can it can give you a few things in your life, and one of the most important ones that that is a regular theme on this show is that whole DIY thing. You just learn how to to get things done because um, there's nobody's going to get them done for you. So, you know, uh, you know every single person who is in in a punk band when they were a teenager knows how to like make flyers, you know you know, get booked on shows like shit that you, you know, you still don't have to wait around for some older person to allow you. You can just figure it out on your own. Um, and, and I've noticed talking to all my friends, uh, now that we're all adults, like that, that's how we all still get everything done in our lives is the same way. Um, so it'll teach you that it'll teach you how to, how to be self-sufficient. And then it will teach you, um, by traveling, um, what the rest of the world is like. And, uh, that is like, there, that's it's irreplaceable um that lesson for sure you know? for sure yeah for sure and like honestly punk rock and the metal scene has also another thing we forget is, is friendships that you've made all over you the know, world that still i i've got friends yeah it's crazy even from from when i was you know doing those backyard parties you know there's still people i still am friends with you know and um it's 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 a blessing honestly it's it's pretty it's pretty rad it to really have that, is you know it's, it's such a tight community you know and when you lock in with someone from that scene and you guys you're, you're pretty locked in absolutely. you know absolutely absolutely cool. yeah i have it's we you know my band we we did a lot of uh a lot of our shows our our local shows were east la backyard parties there was a couple of small venues in east la like the boulevard that we used to play um like a lot. And, you know, those are, that's like the best scene in LA is the East LA punk scene. You know what I mean? And it's like, I have so many friends from, from the East LA area that I'm friends with now that were like, come see my band when they were teenagers. You know, I was like old ass man. I had, I had people coming to see our band play who were like my kids age, you know? And it's like, I'm still friends with them now. They're like, it's weird. Like watching them become adults and like, you know, it's like talk to them all the time, still online. And it, it's crazy. It's, it's super cool. And like, and again, like we were, when we were chatting before, um, before we started recording, we were talking about, um, fenders in long beach. And I had mentioned that, um, in the, in the eighties, I was down there at a show, um, at like Hyrax cryptic slaughter, like a bunch of, it was like 22 bands or something. And, um, I met Mitch Harris from napalm death before he was in napalm death. And we started tape trading and, you know, I don't know, like, <laughs> you know it's like all these years later like how, you know like how you just don't get that like maybe you get it playing sports or something I, i'm not sure though i think people grow up and, and go away and with the with the music scene it seems like everybody just kind of sticks around forever if they survive <laughs> yeah it's 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 yeah for sure and it's like it's funny, like uh, you just uh, brought up, um, like Kate, like Hyrax and stuff. It's funny. I actually, one of my really good friends just came into town from uh, originally from San Diego. He lives in uh, L.A. now. His name is Barry Tillman. He used to be. Uh, he's from the Chula Vista scene in San Diego, the old Chula Vista hardcore scene. You know, he was in a band called Amenity and and House mm -hmm. of Suffering and stuff, which House is funny Suffering. because Caton, yeah, because Kate actually sang for House of Suffering for for a minute as well, you know, which is crazy too, you know, because he'd. Uh, it, it's just like how the scenes just all intermingle, and it doesn't matter because they were like really hardcore, straight edge hardcore scene, you know. And I, when I was in Sprung, I was, you know, we we're kind of like almost Mister Bunglish doing like crazy shit all over the place, thrash to you know, punk and, and law playing, you know, but we're all just meshed together, you know, and then you still make these kind of friendships, you yeah. know, and that was the reason why I got into unwritten law. Like I had no business to, I, honestly being in that band, to be honest with you, because sprung was not right. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but for them to even consider, Hey, let's give PK a call, you know, cause we were always cool and they somehow we got along well and we were always part of the same scene, even though we're, completely right different, dude, you know totally and um that gave me and uh you know my time in unreal law it was tumultuous but it was also fucking awesome too i had some of the times of my life in that band as well you know and through that band i've made 
tons of friendships and like you know and that i still keep contact with and it's it's great so it's awesome if i go to australia i'm <laughs> set you know i got so many you know like it's like people are family and stuff now it, it's it's weird it's through that whole scene you know it's like you said do you still keep contact with all those people yeah you know? i'm, I'm like it's i'm cool. lucky that like i have a ton of friends in sweden like if i'm like that's how it is for me with sweden it's like if i went to sweden i'm set up in like four different major cities in sweden <laughs> if i ever got lost there i'd be in perfectly fine shape um like a, a little quick shout out um to Caton. um we we played with hyrax tiny club show um and uh i was like on stage you know like side stage on the stage during hyrax's set just like screaming my lungs out and um Caton just grabbed me um during hate for hate for power and just like handed me the mic and I got to do that song fronting Hyrax and I was like oh, it's probably the greatest the probably wow. the greatest moment in my entire musical career was getting to sing for Hyrax for like fourteen seconds or however long that song is. <laughs> That is yeah, awesome. I love that dude. I, I did uh, <laughs> I did artwork for for Hyrax and for um Caton's um label like you know 20 years ago, way back when. So we we've been friends forever. He's just the nicest, like he is the most dedicated metal scene dude, dedicated. man. Like still to this day, and like, for real, because I follow him still and and I just love that he's still all in hundred percent. And he's, he's the like, most metal it, it's dude awesome. ever. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, and that damn vibrato, you know, it's like, yeah. come on, man. I, I, I actually have a high rack vinyl up there somewhere in there. I got some yeah, high rack think, in uh, there. I have very little vinyl left from my original collection. I moved to Hawaii for a number of years, for a year. And um, it costs a lot to ship your stuff there. And it's all done by weight. So I, I couldn't uh, bring any of my records. So I kind of just before I left all my friends got gifts. <laughs> and so, um, uh, that's the one thing I never, I'm glad I never got rid of was somehow I managed to hold on to my vinyl. And, uh, and so, and you know, in my, in my house, I don't even have a CD player hooked up. It's just strictly, strictly vinyl. Yeah. You know, I mean, so. I kept, I kept all my discharge records and I kept all my misfits records and everything else yeah. much went. And, and I, and any of the Slayer vinyl I had, I think I still have an original pressing, of rain and blood that I bought like the day that it came out. Um, but other than that, yeah, most of my new stuff is new vinyl. Like, um, high on fire is my favorite metal band. And, um, I've been super yeah. lucky, yes. um, to, to have a, a good friendship and working relationship. I've done t tons of shirts for them over the years and me and the drummer Des are good friends. And, um, so like they played a show at the Viper room or something like a, one of their small shows. And I was hanging out and Des was just like, do you have like any of our stuff on vinyl? And I was like, no, not really. I don't, I, I just haven't been collecting vinyl forever. And he's just like, just come down and take one of everything. So I had like the entire high on fire oh, catalog. I was like, yes. everything. <laughs> Hell yeah. Dad's no longer in the no, high on yeah, fire though, He right? left, which is kind of weird. Cause it, it, um, I don't want this to sound like negative at all, but, um, I feel like, I am less attached to them as a band now, um, now that Des isn't in the band. But the reason right. why I became friends with them in the first place was their original bass player, George Rice. I, we grew up together. And so I, I was just like, you know, uh -huh. I was just like immediately in their little circle. And, um, and so when he left, it was the same thing. I was like, mm. and then me and Des became friends, like, and stayed friends forever. And, um, and I, and, you know, Des, Des had problems with his back for a long time. And I think, um, he, you know what I mean? He, he gave his body to heavy metal for long enough. So, you know, oh, no problem with that. Yeah. And he's just the nicest, he's just the nicest dude, you know? Yeah. Uh, great oh, fucking the, band the, though. As Good far Lord. as I'm concerned, the goddamn best heavy metal band. Um, controversial you know claim there i guess because it's such i mean there's so many different types of metal bands but yeah. i can tell you i've been going to shows for for 30 at least 30 years and they're the only band i've ever seen live that every single time i've seen them i i was amazed at how i had forgotten how goddamn good they were even if i've seen them probably 50 times and every time i'm like god damn i forgot yeah i forgot that this is a this is a real thing. <laughs> Seeing high fire is a real thing. Uh, yeah, they're for real. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. For, for sure. Real. Um, 
So one of the things um, I, I friended you on Facebook, you know, like sometime in the last year, just um, because our wives are friends. And I was like, oh, I want to check out, you know, my wife's always talking about you should you should be friends with Pat you should check out his art. So I sent you a friend request and we haven't really ever talked until like right this very minute. Um, but your like the wood burning stuff that you've been doing um, recently like you, you've been doing these coasters that are like all the old like hardcore punk <laughs> logos or whatever, and those things are so dope, dude. Like, <laughs> I love those things. Um, you know, you know what, brother? You after we're done with this, send me your address. I'm gonna nice. make you a set for sure. On because, but here's a couple. Like one. Yeah, that's so rad. <laughs> Dance. Uh, that's funny you just brought this up, but then I got the king. Of course. King. The king, I got little Slayer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Slayer, of course. Motorhead, Motorhead here. This is my collection. Like I was supposed to sell these. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna kill them on the feet. Got my SOD. Got my corrosion. that COC logo's got to be in the top and five all time pick. band logos for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My all my date for sure. So yeah, for sure. My daily driver hoodies that a CO, that COC logo hoodie has my, been my daily driver for like the last five years. Um, so so what good. made yeah. you think, what made you to, think to start set. doing those? So, uh, well, you know, um, Mars, she, you know, her dad's like this crazy good Le Carpenter, you know? And so, and Mars been like, you know, it's fun. So we also do these uh, cutting boards together. So she'll make the cutting boards and then I'll burn them, you know? And, um, so been doing that for a little bit. She did these custom cutting boards. And then I just had these scraps pieces of wood and I was like, cut out, like, I'm gonna make coasters. And that's just kind of what, and then I was like doing them just shit. I like, you know, really it, it's fun for me until people ask something <laughs> of right. me, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And then it, Cause we're doing cutting boards for a while and then Mars would be, or people would be like, Hey, can you make me, I want this. And then it starts becoming not fun. Then I start, stop doing cutting boards. Now it's, you know, unless there's something for a friend or something, you know, like I really want to do. So I would just start doing these cutting boards, punk rock, cutting boards, metal, um, um, just whatever I want to do until people start wanting what they want and then then i yeah imagine back, with like, with your you know tattooing that you get enough of that in your daily life having people tell you what art that they want you to put on them yeah yeah so i mean initially you came here because you saw what i was doing and you liked it but now you're asking me what you want like, fuck that i want to do what i want you know i'm, I'm old now it's like i don't have time for that shit anymore so you know it's, you want to you like what I'm doing, then yeah, I'm down. And, Cause then it's fun, you know, but if I'm doing something that I have no interest in, it, it starts become just, I'm just due for the motion right. of it. Yeah. And yeah. And if it's you like know. your, for your, your fun side gig, like, yeah, you don't want to be, you don't want to be beholden to some, you know, to some, something that you're not interested in. I totally get that. Yeah. I, I, uh, one of the things when, when yeah. these episodes are, uh, when I, when I edit them together, I always put up, uh, different images of whatever I'm talking about. If there's something interesting. So I'll, I'll, I'll pluck some of these off of your, um, off your Facebook page and I'll, I'll post them while we're talking about it. So people can see, awesome. people can see them cause they're super dope. They're so, they're awesome. super cool. Uh, like it was like, I was like, I don't know this dude, but he's like, right. He's getting it right with these coasters for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm sending you a set Stoke. for sure. Now do you think, cause now, this kind of stuff, like, it's not even about the money, really. It's about, you know, you have the same interest and love for it, and it, it, it kind of fuels, it kind of gives me a spark. And I'm like, if it's going to make you happy, it makes me happy, and then it stokes yeah, you they'll, out, Yeah, they'll you know? be great in my, so in my, love, my big show. giant art studio. Um, like, me, me and Marcy were oh, yeah. talking a little bit when she was on about, like, you're a collector of things, and, um, and I... I <laughs> I like have like what the the yeah. toy shelf behind me is like it represents about a tenth of my collect toy collection. Like I could fill ten of those racks 
just the same as I, I have right now. Yeah, like my, yeah, my thing too. is um die cast cars. Like I just I started collecting die cast cars like twenty years ago and um I have so many of them. <laughs> and it's like I kind of gave up for a while and now it's yeah. like starting to come back. It's starting to creep back in a little bit. Um and so like <laughs> I have so many rubber made bins and my wife's like it's like like something will come from Amazon. She'll be like, what's that? And I'm like yeah, some cars, and it'll be like the entire nothing. 2018 yeah, set of Gran Turismo Sport uh, <laughs> Hot Wheels. You know, all eight in this in this selection. She's like, "What do you need those for?" And I'm like, "Because <laughs> they make me happy." That's so funny. Because sometimes, yeah, I'll intercept packages. You know, just so that Marcy won't see him. I'm really <laughs> seeing this now. Sorry, hon. <laughs> the You're jig is up. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but the thing is. I, you see now you brought something up that just makes me crazy it, i get so mad every time i think about it and uh rest in peace to my dad because you know but i had a collection all my like toys i had a collection of all every gig all my oh. flyers punk rock flyers i had boxes like you know filled and um you know when i moved to san diego college I put everything in boxes in my dad in in the my mm. parents' house, the garage. I had boxes of all my old flyers, killer ones, you know, irreplaceable. I had a boxes of toys, all my Shogun. Remember oh, the yeah. old Shogun yeah, had warriors and yeah. stuff, Big, like OG ones, of Ultraman, all my like really top notch toys. And I just remember coming home one day, and where's my shit at? You know, and my dad going, you grown man. Why do you need toy? What's paper and toy? You don't, you don't need that. Uh, well, you grew, you old man. Now you don't need toy. No. Well, you play toy. And I'm like, where's my, where's my, where's those bought that dad? Come on, man. <laughs> and he said, he tossed them out, uh, man. Just toss them all that shit. He's like, you don't, you, you don't play with toys. Uh, and like, he had no idea idea how much money that stuff's worth and how like important that shit's to me you know like oh my god i get goodness. it and i it's still when i think about it i'm like i cringe it just cringes like to think that those were just in a dumpster somewhere or what or yeah just or someone i see someone come across them and just be so stoked some, on them or something. Some guy but like, like some some come, hipster is like walking into a goodwill in glendale and being like why are why are all these mid inbox Shogun Warriors doing here? Like it's always like a weird thing. Every time I go into a thrift store and I start going through vinyl, in my head I always have this fantasy like I'm gonna come across all the misfit <laughs> seven inches, you know, the stuff I don't have. You know what I'm saying? Just somehow like so it's all, you know, so like you're gonna find something well, like crazy like that. The, that's you know? the addiction of being a collector. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i uh uh in a no. similar vein um the only thing that my kid my two sons um were really really into in the 90s and two in and in, in like you know through the the mid to late 90s was they were super into power rangers like they were in that power rangers generation um and so they had like ev because i'm a toy nerd i made sure they had every single one of whatever the cool power rangers toy was for that Christmas or whatever. So they just shitloads of those, of those power ranger toys. And then, um, I very wisely when they got old enough, when they got so into skateboarding that to toys disappeared from their lives completely. Um, I took every single one of their power rangers toys and I binned them all up and I still have all of them up in my attic. And, um, last wow. year, um, this time last year, um, for my 50th birthday, everybody was around and, um, and they were taught, they were talking about when they're kids and, oh, we had that power ranger. We had the, you know, the, the white ranger dragon and like all this stuff. And I was like, you know, I have all that. And they were like, what? And they're like, you know, they're 28 and 30 years old. And they're like, are you kidding me? And I was like, no, I have every single one of your power rangers toys. Like I, even like the Megazord that you like talked through, you know, it had like the, like I got every uh. single one. They're like. <laughs> You're the best dad ever. <laughs> wow. You see, yeah, that's 
I wish my dad did that shit and not throw away all my, my shit. Dad, you know? My dad's a crazy yeah. collector too, so uh, he he would have he would have never done that to my stuff. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, but my dad collects Brutal. die cast cars, but he collects the one eighteenth scale ones instead of the the Hot Wheels size ones. And um, he's like he's sitting basically on my inheritance and <laughs> in a storage unit somewhere. He's got hundreds of these of those things like Earl, wow. like all the big brands like he collected hardcore for a number of years and so um at some point when you know i, I will get all of that and i don't know what i'm gonna do my wife's probably gonna divorce me <laughs> she'd be all you just got to get rid of it all and i'm like no i can't get rid of any of it <laughs> oh you can't Are you kidding dude totally it's crazy it's like even at you know i'm gonna be 50 in march too and I still love, love it, it, man. It's it's. I still love it. Yeah, I love it, man. I really do. I'm still like trying to find old vinyl that I'm still wanting to add in my collection, and you know, I still listen to punk yep. rock and metal. You know, yep. it's my shit. My yep, roots. totally. Um, I have found though in the last um, probably three to five years, I've gone way towards. Um, a lot of the stuff I listen to now is like, um, like the Budos band, like that Neo funk stuff. Um, oh, I just, I got yeah. super into that band. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I've always been a fan of, you know, like garage rock and stuff. So it's like shit like the helicopters and, um, Judah and, and like all of those like hard action, Lucifer. Like I listen to a lot of that action rock garage rock stuff now. Um, cause I can't just listen to death metal and grindcore all the time anymore, you know? No, 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 abs- absolutely. Uh, that's funny you brought up Budo Span cause, uh, one of our really good friends from Sacramento, she, her name's Stacy Wilson. She just kind of been raving about them and she, you know, was like, you gotta hear this band Budo Span. It's like six months ago and like interest is so rad, good. you know, super yeah. rad shit, you know, I would love to see them live. And she she says they're amazing. So she really got us, uh, been uh, raving about them you know and marcy's always been about like all that garage huge that's her scene like helicopters she like all the little are they from Swith- switzerland sweden, or yeah. sweden yeah yeah well helicopters? It, nikki anderson Wait, yeah. from uh from entomb the drummer from entomb this was the band that he he st- he let he's right left right yeah yeah, yeah 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 helicopters helicopters are- Forever Thin Lizzy has been my favorite rock and roll band. Like since I was uh, since I was like eleven years old, um, I've just been an, an insane Thin, Thin Lizzy fan. And then I think probably in like the last decade, like the Helicopters have maybe crept past. Um, uh, they 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 played at Psycho Las Vegas two years ago, and um, and we went to we went to go, but we really the fact that Helicopters were reuniting and playing like for the first time in the states. Um, was the reason like we were like okay we'll we'll pay the money to go to this whole whole Vegas festival and they were they were fucking amazing man they're <sighs> yeah was a Dr- dragon used to be yeah in he's back right? in helicopters he back he's back in, in helicopters because the, the he was in for like the first couple records and then he left to go back to backyard babies um and then backyard and then babies. they replaced uh him with uh Dalquist, and then he passed away. He had a seizure and drowned in his bathtub. Um, and so when they reunited, um, they just got Dregan back. And so it was kind of the original lineup, which was, it was sick, man. They were so good. Yeah, he's he's pretty rad because um, I remember helicopters because of Marcy was really into him. So they're just a uh, super rad band. And then I remember when the first Warp Tour, when I was in Unwritten Law, we did Backyard Babies oh, wow. were on it. So I got to hang out with Dragon for a little bit. You know, we'd party and and drink a little bit, you know, and hang out. And they were a rad band. And then later on, I was in uh, in a band called Black President. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You you know know? Charlie Paulson? (laughs) Yeah, I know Charlie. So um, that band, I joined for about a year. That was a really pinnacle turning point for me that it kind of saved me because Unwritten Law was just going – I really hate at that point. I was really not liking being in unwritten law and the direction it was going. So, um, I had an opportunity to play in black prep for a minute. Cause Jason Christopher, the, the, the bass player of, uh, black president had some issues. He had to kind of get healthier, you know? So I kind of stepped in for, 
for a year while he was getting healthy. And um, it, it was like so like full throttle punk rock and what I really needed to keep me in, in interested in playing music, you know? Okay. So at that point, when I joined black president, um, Greg Hetson was in the band. So you got to understand for me, like it's kind of legend for anybody who doesn't know, Greg, Greg, Greg Hetson is the guitar player for bad religion. And he was the original guitar player for uh, circle jerks, which yes. is my first hardcore punk band that yes. I ever heard. So I remember just like me, that was like, he's a legend. <laughs> he's a legend. <laughs> to so say the for least. me, like as, as like, to me, that's rock stars to me, you know what I'm saying? So I remember sure. the first yeah. rehearsals and stuff and I'd be playing and I'd just look over to my right and I'd be like in my head, I'm just going, <laughs> that's fucking, I'm jamming with Greg Hudson right now. You know what I'm saying? You, you, that feeling of, I, it was totally, so over, yeah, yes. like, like my, I'm just like, holy shit, I cannot believe this. It's like a pinnacle for me, you know, I'm jamming with Greg Hudson and uh, I actually got to do two shows with Hudson live. Uh, one, we did a show at Alex, Alex's bar, you know, in Long Beach. Yeah, Long Beach. And we did a Knitting Factory when it was in Hollywood Boulevard, you know, oh. so that's that that the the knitting factory hollywood has come up on this show numerous times because that was me and my friends uh at, like every weekend hang out for for years um and it's missed <laughs> sorely that's funny yeah so we got to do i uh, did two shows with greg at that point and then then he took off and um you know playing charlie and uh, uh christian martucci and you know tie on drums at that point and you know, and once again those are friendships i still keep a lot you know because after black president christian martucci who is uh the singer of black president uh and guitars uh we did another side band called thousand watt stare so that was with oh, yeah i remember that ben i didn't know you were part of that so it was me on bass christian on guitar and vocals and dylan howard and then on drums and then Dylan's brother Trevor joined in later as a second guitarist. And we did that for about a, you know, a year, year or two, we did an EP and a, a full album. And that was another thing that really kept me in check and let me like, if I didn't do that, I would probably would have left Unwritten Law a long time ago. You know what I'm saying? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Black president was, that is, that is a seriously good band. Like I remember when I first heard them, I was like, where the fuck did these guys come oh, from? <laughs> yeah. The second is, uh, you know, I had the, you know, our original drummer of unwritten law, Wade human actually put in black president for a minute too. That's was kind of like D that band has had a lot, a lot of, of people. Different yeah. Members. So it was a revolving door. So, and then I came in, but yeah, that band was furious and it was so fucking fun. And Mars was like, Marcy, even yeah. Marcy was like, that, of all the bands I've been in, that's her favorite, Black President, you know? And then, so that's I that for awesome. a year. And then it came to a point like Unwritten Law had to do another record. And then Jason cleaned up and got healthy and was ready to come back. So, and at that point, you know, I was like, I went back to Unwritten Law and, um, you know, they continued on, put out the record. Uh, which the rad thing though is on the album I'm still on two two tracks playing bass so they let me they nice. let me stay on two tracks of it which you know is awesome and 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 even Jason Christopher man that guy is one of my favorite bass players he's fucking furious he's also an author he wrote a book uh Road to Nowhere which is amazing about it. he's got that guy's got crazy ass life too and you know now he plays in prong and he you know he's amazing dude everyone in that band is just rippers and the thing about black president really kind of uh boosted my ego and like made me realize that okay i actually can keep up with these guys then that means i'm i'm doing something right you know what i mean because <laughs> right yeah, so yeah. It, was, it was pretty rad to, to have that experience it kind of solidified that okay you know i'm not gonna i'm, I'm actually okay you know it was cool. It was a cool yeah, feeling. That's... Like it was really good for my soul to do that. Thing. Yeah. Hey, man. Look, <laughs> playing music. If playing music isn't good for your soul, then you know you, you gotta think about what you're 
spend your time on. Uh, but you were, I mean, you, you were a professional musician. So being an unwritten law was like, you know, not that it would in a negative way, but it was like your job, you know, that's how you made your, yeah, life, yeah, you know? for sure. So I totally get that. It's funny that you, that you brought up prong because when, when we were setting up, uh, you have a prong record right behind you, oh. <laughs> right behind your shoulder. And I listened to, um, whose fist is this anyway today? <laughs> it's like prong, it's like prong shout out. Yeah. Day. <laughs> prong, what a, like seriously, that's an underrated band to me for sure. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and going back even to um, the Psycho Las Vegas where we went and saw the helicopters, um, Danzig uh, played one, uh, headlined one night and, you know, Tommy Victor is his guitar player now. So it's like the super, it's the super prong, super prong shout yeah, out. Yeah, um, real, real quick. I noticed on uh, your page that, do you know uh, Seven Sons? Do you know, do you know Mauricio? Maurice Nunez at all? The uh, dancing, the I, dancing, yeah. uh, seventh son. Oh yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know him personally. I just oh, okay. know, through, you know through, through, through that. Yes, through that, through that. Yeah, because I, I did, um, I did a poster for Electric Frankenstein. Um, that was an opening gig for Danzig, uh -huh. and um, I I posted it up there once, and so that's oh, okay. how we became connected. Gotcha, gotcha. But, and then I I know a. One of Danzig's um, like inner circle friends, Danny Fuentes, who um, runs Lethal Amounts in LA. Shout out, Danny! Um, I, I kind of know all those the Danzig people, you know, through through Danny as well. He 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 printed my posters for a little. Oh, while. awesome! That's funny because uh, Maurice, uh, I went to junior high and high school with him as well, and he's the one yeah. that got me into the Misfits and Danzig. We used to follow Danzig around like Grateful Dead shit, you know. I remember like hey, once yeah, we dude, drive down it. to uh, uh, down into Hollywood when American Records were there and go in and uh, get like posters and shit, get the signed shit, you know. It, it's just funny. Like we, we would follow Danzig around like crazy and it's, it's crazy that he's the head guy now for the Danzig band, you know, Seven Son and shit. Still, uh, still Danzig doing. I think was when – I, when I moved to L.A., um, to start my career in video games. Um, we, I, I, our offices were right on Robertson Boulevard, like almost like one half block down from the Ivy, which is like people who aren't in LA don't really know. It's like the, the, the famous restaurant yeah. where every single like, famous yeah. person goes to lunch to have like big meetings and stuff the, directly across the street from that is there used to be a coffee place called the newsroom. And it was like an equal thing. It was like people would eat their lunch at the Ivy and then they'd walk across the street to the newsroom to get coffee. And um, like the first week I was in LA, uh, I was just, everybody was walking down to the newsroom like on a break to get, you know, coffee or whatever. You walk in there and it's fucking uh, Rick Rubin, oh. Jimmy Page and Danzig all having coffee together. And I was what? like, holy shit. <laughs> I was like, that's a lot of powerful people all in one little spot. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, that's the thing about LA though. You you know how it is when you when you're when you live here. You just run into people. Yeah, you I just mean, run into people well, yeah, all over you the place. Used to live in Echo Park, right? So, you know, like whenever I had uh friends used to come visit, because I used to live right across the street from the Dresden, right on Vermont, you know, in that brick building. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I lived there sure. for a few years. So but like, you know, when always had like out of towners come stay with me and be like Hey, you want to see Danzig's old house? You know the one on Franklin, <laughs> <laughs> the the, yeah, black the black house, house had the wall of bricks in front with the wrought iron <laughs> gate. You know, every once in a while you see yeah, his totally. black jaguar out in front and stuff. You know, but like, yeah, man, it's funny. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I am. I mean, any single person who knows me on 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 planet Earth knows that the misfits are they're like in my top five all time yes. for sure and like i raised my kids on the misfits like some families raised their kids on the beatles and so um like my my all of my kids favorite band is the misfits too and when they did the reunion show uh when they started doing those reunions um the the show was put on by live nation mm -hmm. and i was playing goalie and for the for the live nation sponsored men's ice hockey team. And so like the guy who ran the team was like a big, big guy at, at, uh, at live nation. And I was like, those tickets sold out in like yeah, 10 so minutes. Quick. And so like, I never asked him one time 
for any tickets to anything. And I was like, dude, you got to help me. I need like five tickets to the Misfits. And he's like, yeah, dude, don't worry about it. So I had to take my kids to see the Misfits. And like, it was like one of those like greatest moments of our our family's life yeah <laughs> to see them as that's so rad because i have like <clears throat> video footage of my kids when they're like four or five years old they're singing like a tv casualty now they don't give they won't even go there at all you know they're on to their own, own thing they never stuck with it but you know they're all like singing tv casualty misfit stuff like i was more misfits than a ramones guy you know it's just misfits oh, oh yeah for sure. you know for so sure. i was able as well to to go see the Misfits in Oakland, you know, when they came through here and, you know, to be able to see that yeah. was pretty fucking cool. And, um, when you get a chance, remember thousand watts there that I did, we do a cover of TV casualty on there and it's, I think it's pretty killer. Uh, so look that up. I'll check that I'll out send, for yeah, sure. I'll, send that I'll check you. that out for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so like before we, before we go, um, or my wife's going to kill me if we don't talk about those, uh, those sandwich bags, the, 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 um, the lunch bags. And it's funny because I have, I have a friend, uh, her name's Carmen Rimple. She's a, um, shout out Carmen. She is a, uh, an illustrator designer and she does that for her son's <clears throat> lunch bag. And then, so when, when Christy said that you do that for your, your kids, I was like, Oh, that's dope. I want to check it out. And dude, we, we, went, <laughs> I went and like, we just like scrolled through all of those and I was dying. Those are so cool. Oh, man. thank you. I really appreciate it. I mean, that was, that was really fun, you know, and I would, I would just bust those out, you know, kids and, um, they didn't give a shit about it, but you know, <laughs> maybe later on, but you know, somehow I, I still got a bunch of them left over. Some of them like, a lot of, you know, it's weird. Like a lot of them, my kids' teachers wanted them. Like, so they give them to the teachers or, you know, shit like that. But yeah, it's fun. I'll, I'll put up, I'll put up some images of some of them so people can see what I'm talking about. They're like really intricately <laughs> drawn lunch bag art, um, <clears throat> which is super cool. And you know what? Uh, how old are your guys' kids now? Uh, if okay, you don't mind, they're please, 11 and 14, but my youngest one, Max, she's going to okay. be, well, tomorrow's her birthday. So it's, uh, they'll come back around. They'll come, they'll come back around once they're, once they're adults, they'll be like, dad, that was so cool that you did that. Like, I guarantee you they will. <laughs> It'll come back you know, the around. The funny my thing though my is my youngest, my youngest daughter, her, you know who her favorite band is? Is who's that? ABBA. <laughs> fucking ABBA. Okay. I love ABBA yeah. too, but uh, it, fucking uh, ABBA. You know what uh, is planned tomorrow? You know what? <laughs> I took the day off tomorrow to hang out, and you know what we're doing tomorrow? We're watching Mama Mio 1 and 2. <laughs> I'm just going to listen to ABBA and just do whatever else she wants, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's kind of what happens, though, right? Like, you know, like, uh, I was, like, super into, like, uh, when I was a teenager and I was, like, getting, like, I was into punk, when I was kind of going from punk rock into, like, the the, the metal scene, um, I got like, I just got super into like the Sonics and like, you know, like, like old sixties, like lo-fi garage rock and stuff like that. Cause it was like what my dad grew up on. You know what I mean? My dad was like a, like a little low level, um, uh, hoodlum hot rod guy in the Seattle scene in the sixties. And right. he turned me onto the Sonics when I was at, cause like he heard bands like the adolescents and circle jerks coming out of my room and he's like, oh. Oh, that's, that's not like, and, yeah. you know, he's like, that stuff's been around forever. And I was like, no, we're not. It's like totally brand new. And he's like, well, then you need to listen to the Sonics. And he put on the Sonics and I was like, oh, yeah, it's pretty yeah. much the same thing. <laughs> that's so cool. I like that. uh, the Sonics are a band that comes up uh, on this show quite a lot. And, and so is um, to, to speak to the Abbott thing. Uh, one of the reoccurring um, topics on here is ha the sheer number of amazing bands that come out of oh, Sweden. Yeah. Of, of any genre of music, whether it's pop music or metal music or, or whatever it is. I think the only thing that they've never been able to compete with is country music. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the only genre they can't yeah. compete with America in. <laughs> oh, um, so yeah, uh, I appreciate you coming on, dude. This has been really fun shooting the shit. And once all of this quarantine shit is over, me and my wife will have to come up and check out the winery yeah. and hang out with you guys up in, in Placerville. Um, cause you know, we go up cause my, 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 
my sister's still in um, in San Mateo area, mm-hmm. and my parents are still in San Jose. So you know, we have to come up a couple yeah. times a year, and usually one of those times is so my wife can get her hair done by your wife in San Francisco. And so we'll just have to like all hang yeah, out. Yeah, that'd be you know, that'd be time. amazing. It, it's not once that it's far safe either. to do yeah. so. San Jose is really not, <laughs> not that not far. All. It's like you know a little further than going to LA, San Diego, you know, but. Not yeah bad. yeah no and it's like you know we both work for ourselves so you know if we want to take a couple of days and 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 make a trip an offshoot trip like that we awesome. totally do it um yeah so we'll have to do that for sure and um yeah uh i appreciate you coming on dude it's, it's been really cool talking to you and you know talking music and hearing your story about you know how you you made your way through the music scene and how you ended up you know kind of being an artist and that's Right on, right on, right in line with, uh, with the show and, and how I, and how I, uh, I like to present things. So it worked out well. Can I throw one more little, uh, plug real quick? I, I forgot to mention, Absolutely. uh, I work at Hangman Tattoo, Platteville. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, come, uh, check out, uh, Hangman Tattoo on Instagram and, you know, if you need work, we got a bunch of killers in store. So it's all good. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. All right. I'll talk to you soon, Pat.